You are listening to Mahogany Says Radio Show with Mahogany Silvering. MahoganySilvering.net Hot Coffee An interracial romance by Donna R. Mercer Roman is a playboy but one too many scandals has put his CEO position in jeopardy. He must find a nice girl one that the board of Hemingway Industries would approve of and get married before the new year. Kamaya is just the woman he needs with her wholesome, clean image. Roman is the one man who has ever held a place in her heart, but she has no plans of marriage, only philanthropy. So Roman must prove his love and earn Kamaya's trust or risk losing it all. Everyone needs a little cream in their hot coffee. An Interracial Romance by Donna R. Mercer. For more information, visit www.donnarmercer.com. Hot coffee. Get your copy today. Passion Pride, Alejandro. An Interracial Romance author, Mahogany Silvering. Alejandro, the son of a Jaguar king. He doesn't want to be king. When he has a premonition of a human woman's fight with drug coyotes, he rushes to save her. He takes her on the run to keep her safe from the cartel who mistakenly believes that she has stolen from him. Alejandro and Regina fall in love. However, when his father is killed by cartel enforcers, Alejandro is forced to become king. But Regina feels unworthy to be his queen. Can this reluctant jaguar king lead his people to protect his homeland? and make Regina a human, his queen. Passion's Pride, Alejandro, a romance author, Mahogany Silvering. Available on Amazon. Get your copy today. You are listening to Mahogany Says Radio Show with Mahogany Silvering. MahoganySilvering.net Hello, good evening everyone. I'm glad you can join us. I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties we seem to be having and I hope that our our, our guest host, excuse me, will call back in soon. But you are listening to Mahogany Says and I am your host, Mahogany Silverain. So we are having our guest Simone Bo's voice today. So I will see if she's called oh, it looks like she's called back in. Hey, Moni, are you there? Hello? I guess she's not there. Uh, Just hang on just a few moments. We'll be right back. Fresh Meat, an interracial erotic romance by best-selling author Elle Loren. Spending bike week in Daytona Beach was supposed to be researched for an upcoming movie role. Smoke had no idea all the perks of being an undercover biker would offer. He couldn't afford any mistakes, so he took a vow of celibacy. However, fate had other plans. As soon as he arrived, a beautiful little spitfire sparked his engine, and he threw those vows right out the window. Baby Bird captured his heart in one day. Now his mission is to make her his and claim his own happy ending. Fresh meat. Part of the Lunchtime Chronicles by best-selling author L. Loren. Available on Amazon. Get your copy today. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us this evening. And Moni, are you on the line? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, awesome. <laughs> okay, well, welcome to the show. I'm sorry we, we keep rolling. We keep going. So, uh, one monkey don't stop no show. So, technology, exactly. behave. <laughs> Not at all, we're going to do this. 
So tell us a little bit about yourself. I grew up in a military family. I went to University of Southern California uh, for college. I went to film school there and so worked in the film industry for 16 years. And then being the avid traveler that I am, I left the U.S. in 2016 to go travel full time. I sold everything I owned and left the U.S. to go travel for a year. Wow. When I got back, that's when I got into um, (laughs) writing. Yeah. (laughs) So when you came back, you got into writing and what, what inspired you to do that? Well, I had started writing before I left. I was writing fan fiction at first, and then I found the site where a lot of women of color were posting like original stories. And at first, I just started out as a reader, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to write something. So I would literally like come home at night after working like a 16 hour day, like on a set or wow. doing an event or something like that, <laughs> write like a chapter a night. And that's actually how I wrote Redemption of the Heart, my first book that I put out. Nice. The Redemption of the Heart, what was that about? Um, um, so it's kind of a, a, a dark romance in terms of he is uh, an ex-con who mistakenly killed somebody by being on the road drunk one night, but she was running away from her husband who was abusive. And when she gets out, she ends up falling in love with this guy and they don't find out till later on that they're connected through that unfortunate incident. And so it's kind of oh, like wow. in their love overcome that. Interesting. Well, that's good. I like that. I like the forgiveness part. And then see if yeah. you know, characters can be redeemed, especially. If exactly. pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> because like, oh my God, this some characters you read and you're like, oh, I don't think there's any redemption for this one. He got to go. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So did you always know you wanted to do paranormal stories or? You know, no, I didn't. Obviously, when I first started, I was writing um, contemporary. I've always been a big fan and reader of paranormal. But one day I got this idea for a story and I was like, oh, my God, I have to tell this. And so that was how the Oracle Chronicles was born. Um, besides reading a lot of that, I also watch a lot of like sci-fi, I guess you would say paranormal urban fantasy kind of stuff on TV. And so for me, it was always like, well, I love reading these books, but sometimes it's not always easy to find um, stories that have the, you know, black heroine, usually like they're the sidekick or, you know, the friend. And I'm like, I want her to be the, you know, (laughs) I want her to be the lead of the story. I want it to be her journey. So that's how I started writing that series. Oh, nice. And I started reading the series, the first one. I'm still on the first book, uh, Awakening. And it, I really got into it. I almost didn't want to put it down. <laughs> I will say because of my film background, I tend to pace things very, because in my head, I see it like an episode of TV. Um, yes, so it's funny. Most people exactly. that read my writing, they're like, I could see that. I was like, yes, definitely. You, you could definitely tell. I'm like, wow, this is a show. I'm a movie in my head. I mean, most of the time when I read, it's like that anyway. But this was like, seriously, I'm, I'm picturing what they look yeah. like. And seeing, you know, play out in my head and this girl does not know or whatever, but it's just, you know, all these things. And I love Matt. Oh, I know. Every, that's uh, everybody's face. He's actually getting I, his own. <laughs> he and Sage are going to get their own spinoff that I'm working on now. So Nice. Yeah, that would be awesome. I, I definitely think I can do no book. <laughs> I guess I, have, I haven't finished, but I was like, I looked at him like, oh, time went by. <laughs> It was really interesting. I I like the way it started out, and I had no clue at first, like, where this was going. But by the fourth chapter, I'm like, okay, all right. The guy in the dream, all right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I had a lot of fun writing this. It was what what I do love about paranormal is, like, the world building and, you know, really fleshing that out because there's always so much mythology and, like, vampires or shifters and things like that. And so I did a lot of research obviously like in terms of just even kind of gathering it's like okay what are the mythologies or what can I play around with and make like my own thing so that was kind of fun of figuring that out like what are the rules in my world that um, pertain to each yeah. like the witches or you know each faction because it is up to the author I mean seriously you can create anything that I mean I don't understand why people want to get upset if she wants her vampires to sparkle like marble let her do it yeah her world <laughs> I had many exactly. Really that's what, that because that's what's so like, fun about paranormal. Vampires don't yeah, sparkle. Exactly. I said, well, maybe not in your world, but in hers they do. In hers they do. <laughs> yeah, so you'll have to get used to that reality. For her. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know. So how long have you been writing uh, and publishing? Well, I actually, I mean, I guess like everybody, look, I was a writer as a kid. Like I wrote a lot of like short stories and poetry and even like got some published in different anthologies and things like that. Um, and then I ended up 
kind of putting it down for a little bit once I got to college and I was doing more filmmaking. At that point, I was producing, so I was kind of helping other people tell their stories. It wasn't until, like I said, I shortly before I left the U.S. that I will say, like, I got divorced at one point, and um, shortly after that, some friends thought it would be really good and, like, cathartic. They're like, you used to be a writer. You should write, like, that way, you know, channel, you know, some of what you're feeling into that. And so I'd gotten back into writing poetry and then gradually graduated from the poetry to the fan fiction and then I was like oh I'm gonna write and at the time when I was writing Redemption of the Heart I had no intention of like publishing it I was just enjoying creating characters and and that kind of thing that and so it was while I was gone that I started seeing a lot more women from the site like pulling their stuff down so they English and I was like oh I should think about that but while I was traveling I actually kind of fell into ghostwriting (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was how I was kind of making some of my money. Yeah, as I was traveling was I started ghostwriting for people. So at the time, I still didn't have any books out, but I was just ghostwriting. And even once I got back to the U.S., it had become pretty lucrative for me. So I kept ghostwriting. And so I was still ghostwriting at the time I put Redemption of the Heart out. It wasn't until after that and kind of learning more about the publishing world. I mean, having been a ghostwriter, I definitely don't frown upon it. I mean, I get, you know... um, sometimes the demand people want to keep putting stories out and they want to do it at a, you know, rapid release. Um, For me, it became a little bit of an, I guess you could say, ethical dilemma in my own mind. I mean, everybody has to make up their own Mm -hmm. decision, but for me, it was just, it didn't feel as bright anymore. I mean, I knew, you know, I was making money off of, but there was something about it that did not sit well with me, so I stopped. So what was it that bothered you about it, or at least for you? For me, there were, you know, I, I, Redemption of the Heart was like, you know, people were picking up and reading it, you know, I was getting emails from people like about how much they enjoyed it, and and it felt, um, email this writer and be like, oh my god, I loved your story. And it fi- kind of felt like a lie. I felt bad that I might be thieving, maybe is the word I'm looking for. Somebody into oh, thinking okay. that somebody had created this that they did not. And like I said, that's I do not knock it because obviously I was a part of that for a while. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody hey, do what you got to do. Who Like, I'm not here to pass judgment. <laughs> I just know for me, it felt wrong. <laughs> so like I said, I stopped. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you want to be true to your your story and write, it is difficult getting someone else to, they can't write the way you do. Yes, exactly. So what would you give as advice to new writers that are just submitting, just publish? I would definitely say, there's probably a couple of things I would say. Don't try to be like everybody else. I think sometimes we forget. And I mean, I've had to, you know, remind myself sometimes it's that you know nobody can write like me and I can't write like somebody else it's easy to like look over the fence kind of and see somebody else's success or even just we read each other's work all the time in romance and it's easy to be like oh my god I want to write like this person or that person and Mm -hmm. I think we have to remember that our voices are unique so the way I tell us we could all be given the same plot and all of us are going to come up with completely different and unique stories because we shape you know our experiences our opinions our whatever drive and you know create the stories that we tell so as much as I might admire or love the writing of someone else I don't want to tell the story the same way that they tell it and I think Master. that young writers should know that because I think there's a lot of and especially when it comes to like whether you want to do like traditional or, or indie published or whatever it's like don't be afraid to have your own unique voice and style because that's what's going to help you stand out at the end of the day yes. but also the other thing I would say is take the business side of it seriously if you want to be a successful author some that has like longevity or even to start making a certain amount of money and have this be something that you're doing full time, you've got to take the business side of it seriously. Oh yeah, most definitely. That I do agree with. I think that, that we get a lot of people trying to, you know, think they're just going to jump in, get their feet wet and they decide this is too much. But you've got to understand if you yes. are willing to do this, you've got to take the business side to it. It's like, I am yeah. not doing I mean, what I you know, I hear now. people like, oh, I don't want to do this. Yeah. And I'm like, or I don't want to do that. But I'm just like, but it's with any job, even like being a filmmaker, there were still things about it that I did not like or, you know, was, you know, the stuff that sure. you didn't want to do. But exactly. it's like, you got to take the, you know, with anything, you got to take the good and the bad or the things that you love and the things that you hate, you know, because again, that's what makes it successful. You got to have like all your ducks in a row. Like, I know some people don't like to do social media, but it's, you know, in this day and age, it's how you... Yes. You know, people are able to find That's you. Exactly, true. exactly. I was trying to explain it to my husband. He got his first contract this year with Morgan James, and uh, his biggest drawback was, I don't like being on social media. I said, well, welcome to my world, dude. <laughs> not yeah, funny. it's a necessary evil there. for the lack of a better friend. Yeah, do not know you. <laughs> 
They don't know you from Adam. Yeah. So you got to put yourself out there. And he does not like to do that. I'm yeah, because like, I mean, God, not it. having an online yeah. presence, it's almost like you don't exist. <laughs> yes, and he wrote a book called Redemption, but it's uh, Falling Toward Redemption is the name of his. And he oh, is, interesting. You know, so, yeah, his character falls from heaven as an as a angel who disobeyed God and destroyed Atlantis. And I mean, it's really cool the way he wrote it. Was, that sounds very really interesting. Yeah. So it's like from a fallen angel's point of view. But God's decided to redeem all of the demons and everyone else who wants redemption. Is oh, So this angel goes and tries to redeem everyone, take them through the process. It's really cool and interesting. I thought, wow. You no. Know, I said, so this is cool. And I pushed him, you know, I pushed him to do this. And now he's like, but I don't want to be on social media. I was like, <laughs> yeah, but you have to. Yeah, and plus, you're, so you know, people want to learn more about, like, I mean, you know, you don't have to. And this is, it's interesting because having worked in the film, it's like, I, it's, social media is equally important in that area so it's like I'd always you know try to explain to people it's like you can choose how much you you know give of yourself I guess you would say or you know um, share your life on there like you know it doesn't have to be everything but you do have to have right you know a presence yes that way they know you're a real person <laughs> yes exactly as a reader it's really great to find out you know and have access to my favorite authors and it's nice to know that you know there's they're down to earth or not, especially during interviews. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's why I like doing this because, you know, I, I do fangirl sometimes over other, other authors that I've seen their books that I read them. Me too. Oh my like, God. Oh I'm my so God. Like, <laughs> yes. It was funny because um, I think it was Jennifer Probst who um, responded to one of my, or commented on one of my Instagrams the other day, and I was like, oh, my God. And she was like, oh, and I was just like, but I, I mean, even I've been at um, some RWA conferences. It was funny because I remember I was sitting next to, at the time, I didn't realize it was Eva. <laughs> Like we're having wow. a whole conversation. I'm talking. We're talk. I forgot all the stuff that we were talking about. But literally, like hours went by, and she got up to go do something, and somebody called her name, and I turned, and I was like, like the Yvonne that I like rattle off all the books I'd read of hers, and she <laughs> was sitting there like <laughs> laughing, and I'm like, oh my god, I had no idea. I was like, my sister and I read your books all the time. Like I was totally like got a picture with her. Yeah, I was totally fangirling oh. so hard. Yeah, it's easy to do. Yeah. You know, when I was such and such, or your book inspired me to do, you know. And I think that's cool. You know, if someone came up to me and would say that, that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, my God. You know, you, that felt like I made an impact. But at the same time, it's like you're getting all excited. Because I even had two hours that were on my show. One was fangirling over the other. Oh, <laughs> like, I love I that. Back, and I was like, see? I said, see, you got to meet your Exactly. Idol. Yeah. I'm sorry, idol. <laughs> so what comes first for you? Is it the plot or the characters? The characters, almost always the characters. Um, I, I'm very character driven in terms of the way I like see the plot and like how things would happen are very much based on the way I see the characters and the kind of decisions they would make. So when I first started writing, I started out as a pantser. I was a total pantser, would just sit down and like write. I developed more now into a little bit of a plotter. I mean, I'm not, I'm never going to make a completely long drawn out like outline that's like 20 pages deep. <laughs> but Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I've seen some people and I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a lot. I, I can't do that. <laughs> There's a lot for me that I still <laughs> like to see kind of flow on the page as I'm writing it because I feel like I'm one of those people that the characters speak to me, huh. you know, as I'm writing writing it's like they're kind of developing and telling me who they are so usually for the first few chapters I still kind of write kind of like by the seat of my pants so to speak just to see where it goes and then from there I start to get a better sense of the story so then I'll usually stop and kind of start for me it's like I usually know like the overall where I see it going so from there I start doing like smaller kind of like chapter breakdowns of where I see like want to see each go because I wrote right usually in like dual POV so it's usually alternating in each character's perspective of like okay now it's your turn this person's turn nice. um, but yeah very much the characters come first for me even down to the secondary characters I very much like to develop them as well because again from a filmmaker standpoint your secondary characters can make or break your story I always feel like so that is true. for me they have to be really well developed <laughs> And some of them are breakout stars, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, I'm finding that out. Max being one of them. <laughs> he <asked me>. Yes. <laughs> He's like, Max needs his own book. <laughs> 
I haven't even finished the first book, and I'm talking about Max and his book. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Like, everybody is. <laughs> but, yes, those, those are when they jump in and kind of just take over a scene sometimes. And I, I have it in my last yes. uh, book, uh, Alejandro. But I'm like, I did not know where that character came from because <laughs> that was not in my outline nowhere <laughs> at all. <laughs> just like all of a sudden, boom, here I am. <laughs> like, uh where you come from and why are you in this story? <laughs> <laughs> and I know that's crazy, but I know that a lot of people are just, they know what I mean. <laughs> what you're trying to oh, write. yeah, definitely. So how do you come up with the titles for your books? Oh, my God. I am the worst because usually, for the most part, the titles don't come until after I've written it. And I have, like, pulled people and, like, called up. <laughs> like, I am the worst. I hate, like, Almost next to writing the blurb, I hate trying to come up with titles. Like, it is rare ah. for a title to come to me, like, while I'm writing or um, anything like that. It is it is a chore. Like, it is, like I said, next to blurb writing for me, it's, like, one of the things I hate mm-hmm. is coming up with titles because, to me, I suck at it. Oh. Well, actually, I like your titles. I mean, but, uh, well, thanks. Well, like I said, yeah. that's because a lot of, like, <laughs> a lot of external help. <laughs> I know. I'm, in trying to do series, I'm, I'm, I'm learning that sometimes they don't always just come consecutively. And I know you're supposed to put them out like three months, you know, at the latest. Yeah. <laughs> apart from each other. But I have a hard time doing that because I didn't even know what the title was, where they were going to go, what was going to happen until like last week. And <laughs> I've been waiting. Yeah, all you know, it was, yeah, writing the Oracle Chronicles actually is what helped me become a little bit more of a plotter because I was like, okay, if I, I knew there was going to be at least four books, but I was like, okay, what is, what is the story that's going to take me to that point? So that did require a lot of me starting to, okay, how, like, what's the end game? Like who are the villains or who turns out to be somebody that exactly. maybe we didn't expect and things like that. So I wanted to make sure I was dropping like those Easter eggs, those crumbs as I was going along. So that did require me to really think ahead a lot more than I had in the past. Um, and so writing that actually is now kind of shaped my, like my future writing in terms of, I mean, right now I'm working on a few more like contemporary series where I start on some of the spinoffs that I plan from this, the universe of like the Oracle Chronicles, oh. but even in with contemporary, you know, it's like, okay, where are these stories? What are like the, it, with the, it's funny because with a lot of my contemporary, they're more like standalones within the same universe in the series. Right. Mm-hmm. There's one right now that I'm writing where it's like, it follows like the same storyline through like a trilogy, but for the most part, it's like, they're all brothers and you know, whatever. And so everybody has their own story. Um, uh, but I found with Paranormal, I liked the, you know, kind of cliffhanger. I mean, I know some people, it's funny, people say they don't like cliffhanger endings, but most people, it's like, you read the freaking Harry Potter books. They were essentially, it's like, yeah, could they be read yeah, standalone? Were- but you wouldn't necessarily pick up Half-Blood Prince and read it out before you read, you know, like the first book. Exactly. Uh, you wouldn't know <laughs> or at least I wouldn't. <laughs> at yeah. all. I would be totally lost. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so I like those yeah. kinds of stories. Yeah. So it's I, like, I you know, you always hear that. Like, some people are like, I hate cliffhangers. I'm like, ah, secretly you love them. <laughs> it, it depends on the story for me, though. Because sometimes really, it's like, no, no, come <laughs> on. <laughs> no, I could, no, I definitely, I could definitely relate. Because I'm thinking of books where I've literally wanted to chuck the book across the room. Exactly. Yes. That, those are the ones I'm talking about. It doesn't happen with everybody because I do like some cliffhangers. I even have a cliffhanger on my own book, but uh, I mean, yeah. so far, and it worked because I was. It led me right to the next story. But ooh, <laughs> trying to yeah. Trying to <laughs> like, um, I don't know. <laughs> like, oh, now y'all decide to be quiet. Wait, wait. You want you're not talking now. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> when I want to sit down and write, <laughs> everybody's quiet. <laughs> so how do you handle writer's block? Or does that even happen? You know, it's funny. It's not so much blocking of, like, I don't know what to write. It's I get bogged down in sometimes, like, the words or how I want to say it. So sometimes I get stuck. Like, 
because it's like I'll have it outlined out in terms of what needs to go in the chapter or what's coming next. But then I start getting mm-hmm. bogged down and, well, wait a second, I wanted to use this word or have it happen this way. And so I start to get blocked because I get overwhelmed by like, okay, wait, wait, that's not the way that I want it. Cause it's like, I'll have written something and then I'll come back and look at it. And then I find like 20 minutes have passed where I'm stuck on this sentence, you know, where I'm just like, okay, <laughs> yeah. I either have to like put this thing to the side. Cause I tend to write linearly. I usually don't write out of order almost ever. Um, so I usually write very linearly. And so occasionally when I find myself blocked, I'm like, okay, I'm I'm getting stuck in the weeds and it could be like tomorrow and I'm still going to be in the spot. So I either have to put this to the side and work on a completely different project or at that point, like Mm -hmm. I said, make the concession of like, okay, I know I want to keep writing in order, but if I'm going to make progress, I've got to move a little bit ahead and come back to the scene. So I usually just try to, and if that doesn't work in terms of either just like jumping to another scene or even working on another project, a lot of times, like I'm very, like, I love the arts in general. I mean, from film, um, you know, music and all that. So sometimes I might put on music Mm -hmm. or sometimes I might just be like, you know what, it's time for a TV break. Like, let me go, like, yep. sit and watch, like, one of my favorite shows and, you know, get a sense of some of their storytelling and really, you know, so it's not, I don't, uh, as a filmmaker or anybody who's created that kind of content, I almost never really watch something without, like, kind of seeing and, like, looking a little bit deeper to see, like, oh, they chose this camera angle or they, and that can be a little annoying to other people I watch TV with <laughs> because I make comments about those things. Um, but that's always interesting to me. And again, as somebody that creates, like, I like to see the choices because then it helps me thinking of like, why they choose to do it from that angle or to tell it from that person's perspective. And sometimes that helps me think about maybe what might not be working or why I feel blocked in that particular, um, thing I'm working on. Oh, well, see, that's interesting. Cause I, I want to actually learn screenwriting because I do have a story that I, I want to see it. I actually want to see it on film. Just, I mean, as a movie or a TV series, I can I can see it. But it's like I do not know. Oh, you can right. totally write it. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I mean, the story is written, but I have to learn how to write it as a you know as a screenplay, I guess. And that that's one of my things I, w- I would like to learn because I do look at uh, angles or why they're standing there, and it, I picture the whole scene in my head, which is weird. Yeah. Which is, you know, writing. I try oh, to make don't, it. Don't let anybody that, tell you it's weird. That, I yeah. freaking love that your brain thinks that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because people tell me when they read my books that they're like, I can picture myself there. I feel like I'm there. I can smell it. I can taste yeah. it. Yeah. You know? And that's because I, I, I'm a sensory. I'm describing everything in the room, what they're standing next to, what's this, and what's, because that's how I see it. I'm looking about the yeah. room, the characters that I'm looking at. So I think it's kind of weird, but I guess after talking to you, I don't feel weird anymore. <laughs> about <doing that>. <laughs> no, I, not at all. I like doing that. I was like, what's this in here? And I look for Easter eggs, you know, when I watch a movie. So it's the same thing with writing. Yeah. <laughs> And that's like my favorite thing, especially down. whether it's, um, you know, yeah. just one movie or like you watch the series and then you go back to see the things where they planted all the Easter yeah. eggs for you to find yeah. later when you watch mm-hmm. it. I love that. <laughs> see, I, I do too. See, okay, now I don't feel so bad because <laughs> not everybody does that. <laughs> but yeah, I love looking for that. And that's the little YouTube videos. They're like, so what you missed when you saw the movie? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> little, yeah, I love watching those. <laughs> I was like, spoiler alerts, mom. I'm like, no. I've already seen the movie. Not spoiling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to see what I didn't know. Yeah, because I'm always what interested in why yeah. people made the decisions, you know, why a, a a director or a writer or whoever, an actor made the, you know, the the decisions that they make, like how to tell a, you know, or how to portray a character a certain way or um, why, you know, to choose that character to tell that part of the story and different things like that. I always find it interesting and fascinating. I do too. But what irks me to no end being from a military. When you have a military character, <laughs> why do you have them you with a hat like on You like my dad. Inside? My dad does because my dad is was Air Force, no, so he's the same you way. Don't do that. <laughs> that's not what yeah, we that's do. That's why to this day I refuse. I'm like, I am not writing any military characters. It's like, even though my dad was in the Air Force, I was like, I'm staying away. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> 
I know it has to, or their insignia is wrong, or their gig line is off from the uniform, and just like because we had to learn all these things, it was drilled into us. To face the yeah, so that is and the I, thing. Well, you I know, never, I, I did explain to my dad once. <laughs> There's kind of like an unwritten, I guess you could say, rule, um, and it was always one of those, I guess you could say, like mythology that within filmmaking or whatever that you weren't necessarily allowed to have things be like precise or different things like that, which is why sometimes you'll see, because I forgot, I was watching something with my dad one day, and he was like, he's whatever rank, he would never have his, like, I can't remember all the terminology he used, but like, it was something mm-hmm. off of the uniform, and I was like, I don't think they're technically allowed to have it be completely precise, which is why you'll always see a little bit of something a little bit. that's skewed or, yeah. So that is, so there is, I guess you could say, a reason behind um, sometimes some of the uh, mistakes yeah, that I you mean, see. Of course, they're not going to, um, you know, have it exactly yeah. like it, but, you know, but if you yeah, but even like, he's, like sometimes cow, even you know, just plot-wise. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, exactly. That's yeah, also true, you know. <laughs> I think if he's been yeah. doing a really great job, but there are several of them that are just like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> like, who's the consultant is, on that? <laughs> right. You, what consultant did you get? You know? <laughs> yeah. And some of you can tell they had one because, <laughs> you know, it's... It, yes. But, but, yes, but I, I digress. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I could talk about this all day, so... <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> So what time of day do you usually like to write? <sighs> During the pandemic, like, God, um, I got to get better about, like, getting up. I could literally, like, sit at my computer all day these days. Um, but typically the sweet spot for me is actually, like, super late at night. I'm a little bit of a vampire. I will write. Yay! Um, <laughs> yeah, I usually sometimes start writing, like, to me, as early as, like, 10, 1030 at night. Usually sometimes I won't even mm-hmm. start to, like, midnight. And I'll write until, like, 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, I'm just, like, me. I don't have the distraction <laughs> of, like, my phone dinging from every notification coming from yes. um, social media. I don't have to worry about I people phoning off. me because most everybody's asleep. <laughs> there you go. Yes, house is quiet. Yeah. Your dog is asleep and not barking. Exactly. So. <laughs> That's just the best so it's time. Just me and my brain. <laughs> I know. I was, I was telling my dog the other day that, I think my internal clock's off, and she said, no, that's just people thinking that they have to be up and working at a certain time that comes from having a work day. She said, but actually, yes. your body knows when it's the best time for you to be creative or the best time for you to do this or that. And I was like, oh, you sure you said that? Well, I like her perspective. I never thought about that. <laughs> okay, where'd you learn that from? She's like, I read. And she walked out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I read too, but I haven't read that. But thank you. <laughs> She does. She's a, she's a sweetheart. She does a lot of stuff like that. But she's also, um, she has a form of autism. And she is on the higher end, I guess, to the scale. To oh, okay. Highly functioning and highly intelligent. And she's, wow. I mean, just the things level-headed out of all my children. Just go get her. Yeah. Knows what she wants to do. Has everything planned out. Like I said, she's 17 and she wants to do this, this, and this. She had everything. Now she's going to get her car. I'm like, why couldn't your brothers and sisters have done that? But, <laughs> but but they, you know, you know, I hear that. Don't compare me to them. <laughs> <laughs> How many children do you have? I have six. Aww. Uh, four girls and two boys. But the uh, the eldest boy, I didn't get a chance to raise. That was my ex wife's ten. So the youngest boy is who I'm raising. Yeah. And, and Aww. I have like, mm. and it's a really cool bunch because there are a lot of creative minds here. From drawing to writing to singing, it goes through. I went and got a different gift, <laughs> but they're all creative. Oh, I love that. Yeah, she's not the creative part. She's the, I guess, kind of, I, I tease her. Analytical? She's, you know, yes, very analytical. And I say she's Spock-like for people who like Star Trek, because I am a Star Trek fan, and she's my Spock. <laughs> I love but that. Man, cause he's yeah, like, I'm a he's twin, so, so like, both of us characters. have very different, like, ways, because my, yeah, my twin's a lawyer, so she's definitely uh, yeah. very analytical. <laughs> so what's that like, being a twin? You know, it's funny, because growing up, it's, <laughs> I think there's a lot of things <laughs> that I was unaware of in terms of, you know, you have, like, this built-in best friends. We're very close. Um <laughs> And you have kind of this secondhand way of speaking with each other and dealing with one another. And sometimes it can be, I think, alienating to some people, um, especially when Mm -hmm. they're around and it's maybe just like the two of us of one other person because we, whether it's like we're fighting (laughs) or we're doing (laughs) something like, you know, and it's, it's weird because it's like, 
you know, that's what I was born into in terms of our relationship. And so it's interesting when I'm dealing with other people and sometimes I have to be conscious, like, oh my God, I'm not like making you feel uncomfortable or, you know, you feel like you're a part of like the conversation or the whatever, especially when it's just like the two of us and one other person. Because like I said, we have a a tendency to, you know, very much like, you know, it could be something I feel like, have you ever seen that movie before Christmas (laughs) With um, then yes. Swan and Reese. So there's yes. that moment where the, they're playing the game with um, his brother and his wife. And mm-hmm. it's all these things like, you know, the sock on the dresser. And he's like saying words that you're like, how is he getting that from that? That's like literally sometimes our exactly. conversations. And so people are like, <laughs> what is going on right now? <laughs> but you guys. And so a lot of times I try to be very awesome. conscious of like, okay, don't go into like when brain, I guess you can say, when I'm around so many other people that, you know, it might feel like, okay, there's other people in the room besides you guys. <laughs> <laughs> like someone speaking a foreign language. We are. I mean, uh, plus, we're very I, competitive yeah. with each other. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. I remember we did a marathon together some years ago, and we were both like really hurt. Like, I mean, God, I don't know if you've ever done one, but your body is like broken <laughs> after a marathon and no. so we had to take I I've only done a one mile and I was literally <laughs> like I have to outlast her by like a minute so she oh, did no you know, nine minutes in the ice bath, I have to do 10. If she's done 10 push-ups, I have to do 11. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is competitive. <laughs> it's very competitive. But no, we love each other, but it's been great. It's nice to have that kind of thing because it's like it keeps you like motivated or, you know, pushing forward to do like the next thing. So we're always very much like encouraging of each other. Oh, that's good. Does she write, read your book? Oh, yeah, she's definitely. Um, it's funny because she's like one of the people I bounce a lot of ideas off of from time to time because she's an avid reader of romance. So it's always nice oh. to kind of like, well, I was thinking about this. Tell me how you feel about, you know, um, she's actually the one, too, that actually helps me come up with better titles. Because, like I said, if I were to tell you some of the ones I've come up with in the past, and she's like, no, <laughs> let me help you with it. <laughs> like, that is not what needs to go there. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you also do a lot of traveling. So what, what are some of the places? Yes, I love traveling. Ooh, let's see. It's always, you know, because I have different reasons for loving a lot of the places that I've been. Um, for instance, when I went to Egypt back in 2015, I had just went natural. And so I was, you know, at that time I was like 35 years old. You know, I'd had relaxers most of my life. So my hair had been like, you know, straight mm-hmm. and, you know, the what the, you know, beauty standard is, you know, um, that we've been fed. And so I was just going through this period of like, oh, my God, am I going to go back to the creamy crack? Am I going to, like, ride this out? And like, <laughs> um, and it was funny because we're there and all these, you know, all the, you know, Egyptians and stuff, they would comment. I mean, not even just the women, but the men would be like, oh, my God, your hair is so beautiful. And, you know, and it was it was kind of like I needed that. I needed that, like to remind myself that yes our natural hair is beautiful and so it was amazing to be in this other country and have these people like oh my god yeah i know i wish we had more of that in this country (laughs) yeah me too you know (laughs) but now i'm definitely like hashtag big hair don't care (laughs) yeah because we actually have we have to have laws that say we can wear our hair natural. You know, I used to be a fight. Yeah, thing, tell me about the it. Biggest thing, you know, I had to straighten my hair. I said, well, then you're going to give me a pay bump or something because if I have to keep a lot, yeah, to go by your standards of beauty. I mean, that that's, that cost me. That's sixty five dollars every, you know, six to eight weeks and burn. Yeah, down not only does it cost you, but just <laughs> yeah. from um. It, a health yeah. perspective, you know, because when you think about what's in a relaxer, I mean, you know, I was trying to explain to somebody yes. once, I was like, there's a lie. I was mm-hmm. like, it burns your, it could burn a hole in you literally if you left it on your, you know, um, you, yeah, too long. That's exactly right. Yeah. And you I know, so I was like, think burn. about that. Like what we yeah. have to endure to be accepted in terms of, mm-hmm. you know, from a beauty standpoint. I know. And that's, a lot of people didn't understand that or even know unless they've actually gone through the whole process. And it's just, you know, yeah. I, I went natural 10 years ago and I loved my afro, but it got to be too much. So I, now I have it locked. <laughs> yeah. It no, long, it is. Not. That's what quick. I was like, natural hair is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a lot of work. And I kept it. Yeah, I love it, it, but it's a lot of work. It. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I was, mm, arms were aching. And I said, oh, no. Mm, mm. 
Yeah, no, because I, I do my hair is like it. thick and it's big, and like mm-hmm. you said, det- days I have to detangle, like I almost like I don't want to do it. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> like you said, thing. my arms are like so tired. Yeah, it's like everything hurts, and I've had two neck surgeries, so everything hurts from the neck down, and I'm just no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't like to spend all day in a baby shop. Yeah, I said we got to do something. Yeah, God, that used to drive me crazy. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> My mom Especially just, you know how it I goes. Like you, your appointments yeah. at a certain time, and you go in there, and they got two people. I, I'm gonna get to you in one minute. <laughs> but uh, you were supposed to be ready for me when I came in. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, exactly. You said, you said one o'clock. <laughs> Why are you not ready? Yeah. <laughs> no, but now I found an electrician. She has. You are the only person in the shop, period. <laughs> yeah, no, I had pandemic, found somebody like that she, as well. Yeah, she is like, no, you're not going to come in there and find nobody else sitting there waiting because she doesn't like that. And when yeah. we have our appointment, we, it is just us. And that is just... Yeah, yeah like my time is just as valuable as yours. I don't want to be sitting here exactly. for four hours. Right. And she said that she was a lot speedier that way. She gets people in and out, and it's not a big deal. And I'm like, oh, no more four or five hour beauty salon all day, beauty salon all Saturday. Wasted your whole entire Saturday. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. That we had growing up. Because you know all those stories and everything? They fit into the dryer. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was little. I learned so much by sitting in the beauty salon. <laughs> no, that's, that's real talk. Like, that. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, 10 years old looking at everybody watching the ladies just talk freely as if I'm not even there. You know? Yeah. And my mom, my mom took me every three weeks. We went to the beauty supply, me and my sister, <laughs> like clockwork. We knew, okay, yeah. this is Saturday. We ain't going to get nothing done today. <laughs> <laughs> we, we already knew because that was three heads, my mom and, and me and my sister. So we knew it was just, that was it. I brought books yeah. so I could read the whole time, you know, and, and still listen, even though I'm reading, but I could hear still hear the conversation. They thought that driver was exactly. <laughs> He was dropping on everything going on. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, so tell us where we can find your books and if you have a website. Yes, so I do have a website. It's my name, moniboyce.com. I sell all my books wide, so you can find them on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, Kobo, um, Apple, Google Play, um, and then even other sites like Walmart and Books A Million and things like that, especially if you're somebody that likes purchasing um, paperbacks. I always release a paperback copy of my books as well, so you usually can find them on ebook mm-hmm. and paperback. Um, Redemption of the Heart right now is the only one that has an audio book. Um, I'm about to put out the audio book oh, nice. for Awakened within the next couple of weeks. So I'm just finishing figuring that I'm right now. I'm trying to do my research before I like, cause I, um, the audio book for redemption of the heart, like got licensed. So I didn't have to deal with like where to put it. So this is my first time trying to navigate right. the waters of like, you know, putting out an audio book and making sure that I'm doing it correctly. So who did you use for your audio book? Uh, this time I used, um, uh, was it pink flamingo productions? Yeah. Oh, I okay. used them for this one. I yeah, uh, so I used uh, I so, them. yeah, so I paid for this one myself and um everything, and they're the ones who did the production and everything on it. They've done a, a really good job. Oh, nice. Well, I look forward to, to hearing them because I do like every once in a while I listen to an audio book. Uh, I see. It's funny because it's like I love them for the like revenue stream in terms of books, but I'm not really like a fan of listening to them myself. <laughs> I do. I just kind of like this, you know. If I don't, I'm not in a place where I can hold a book. It's nice to hear one. Yeah. Or, you know, or like if you I'm trying, sometimes I'll try to do it like to go to sleep and I'm listening to it and I have yeah. to shut off at a certain time, you know, like listen for 45 minutes or whatever <laughs> and then it cuts off, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's like, again, it's like watching a movie in my head. It's, to me, it's like watching TV. <laughs> it's the same thing. But now yeah. I can hear the characters, you know, it's not just me reading, but I can hear them. Exactly, yeah. But it makes the story come alive more for me. But yes, definitely. Um, that's a new one. I, I used ACX because I only had one book on audio, too. So, And they were pretty good. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, like the, yeah. The yeah, I might have to pick your brain then because I'm just like, how do I, like, what should I use? Because <laughs> I know there's, yeah, like, find the way voices they, they and then now. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for your audition, like, you're auditioning people to read your books and stuff and 
yeah, some of these books, I'm like, you didn't really audition that person, did you? Because they, because I have a book that I really, yeah, really love. Yeah, because that was the thing. Because I, I, I struggled be even with, you know, choosing yeah. my narrators because I'm just like, oh, I want it to be amazing. Um, but I think they did a really that's good, good job, so I'm, I'm very pleased. That's good because I heard some of them, they're just, wow. But that is not what I expected. Or they have a really nasal voice. <laughs> and you just... Yeah, it didn't wow. meet your expectation of what you had in your head for, like, what like, you were. I know, yeah. you, you, I know you had to hear this woman audition for you. <laughs> and you got to still let her read. That's interesting. Because, <laughs> you know, you want an engaging, soothing voice when you're reading And then a voice that actually acts like the characters that they're portraying, especially the actors. Yes. Those just like, so I was very fortunate to find Tony because he was amazing with his accent. He had actually spent time in West Africa, so he knew exactly what I was talking about. And I was like, oh, awesome. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so great. Because he, he nailed it. And I was like, and he's, uh, he's from England, but he also did an American Southern accent very well. I was like, yeah. I always do our accents, but we can't do theirs. <laughs> right? I <laughs> know. That is so <laughs> true. <laughs> it's like, they do ours perfectly. I wouldn't even, I would have never known if some of these actors are English because I thought, you know, when I'm watching them, you know, act, and then they're off set and they have an interview, and all of a sudden they're like, you're English? What do you mean? What is this? Yeah, because I, I had a friend known. who was watching, I don't know if you watched this show, um, Snowfall on FX, and she didn't realize the lead yeah. guy. Yes. Um, the I didn't know he was English too. I didn't know. I, yeah, yeah. I I watched an interview with him, and it was his interview that I saw where he's like, "Nope, he had he had a, a rap star." That, a coach. Uh, yeah, I know. Him. I see that same one. Yes. Yeah, but I'm like, he's waiting for me down the lot. I'm like, uh, okay, I'm going down there because I'm like threatened now. I feel fear because he told me to get down here. I'm like, <laughs> should I really go? <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, but, but he does an amazing job because I would have never known had I not seen that interview. I would have never known that he was English or that he was just brought, you know, and just came over here not even that long. So, <laughs> like exactly, him, yeah. He, he picked up English. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> or American accent. I will say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it has been great talking And then to that you particular type of American accent, yeah. you know, that's always it, when you have to yeah. get into, the, like, the, the dialect slang. in whatever region you're, yeah. Exactly. Because I know just all over America, we all have different accents here. And not even just yeah. the Southern thing, but just the Boston, the New York, the Jersey, the, you know, uh, there's even yeah. like the Southwestern accent as well. Cause I Exa- like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> you all. <laughs> I'm born and raised in the South, and nobody seems to believe me. I said, no, I'm from the South. No, no, you don't sound like you're from the South. Yes, I do. <laughs> to me. But yeah, it's funny because usually some people are yeah. like, where are you from? Because I feel like I hear bits and pieces. Of, I was like, that's part of being in a military exactly. family. I mean, from living in California, I used dude, like, usually yeah. after everything, I'm like, dude, serious. <laughs> And yes, then I do say y'all I do that. sometimes when I'm talking. So. <laughs> and it was especially bad during the, the Valley Girl thing in the 80s. That was, that was so funny. Oh, totally yeah. <laughs> like, gag me. And, yeah, I'm like, yes, totally yes. for sure. <laughs> mm, yes. <laughs> I'm like, there is no way you're from here. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but that was funny. So um, I've enjoyed talking with you, and I hope you come back and get a chance to host with me uh, when I'm talking to another author. Oh, yeah, I would love that so much. That would be so much fun. That would be fun because, I mean, you're, you know, I'm trying to get brave to be able to do this on video, but I'm not there yet. I'm trying, but I'm not there yet. So (laughs) (laughs) I'll try to get over my bashfulness because it's like I feel natural, normal talking, but then I get, you know, there's a camera on me, and I'm like, (laughs) okay. (laughs) What am I supposed to do here? <laughs> Just treat it like there is a good friend on the other side of it. You do that. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show. And for those of you that uh, had a chance to listen, I've been talking with Moni Boyce, who is a paranormal romance author and contemporary author and all-around level person. And she is one of my uh, soul sister romance authors that we have a group of us through awesome ladies who's led by Trish Harley McCarthy. And it is great that I've got a chance to sit and talk with you and 
definitely come back on the show. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much so, for having then, me. I had a really yeah. great time. It was so good. I mean, I know we haven't had a chance to meet in person, but it was nice to connect this way. Yes, definitely. So everyone, enjoy your evening, and I wish you blessings, peace, and love. Don't stop now. Come on. You have been listening to Mahogany Sets with Mahogany Silverain at mahoganysilverain.net. Thank you and good night.